Let's talk about the Digital Communication Peripheral SPI, or Serial Peripheral Interface. SPI is a method of very fast communication, and it also uses a bus, meaning that the same wires can be connected to several different devices, and one additional pin is used to select which device you're talking to at any given time. So we have fast communication, the downside is it uses a lot of pins, but the bus configuration tries to minimize the number of pins that we use. So how does SPI work? Because we're a bus, we have a main device, uh, which we call the master, and it will talk to several devices. So we'll start with just one device. So the master will produce a clock, SCK, and feed that to the device. So every time the master wants to talk to the device, it will generate eight clock pulses to send one byte of data. While it's outputting that clock data, it will output uh, the data itself that it wants to send to the device, SDO. So uh, SCK of the master goes to SCK of the device, and SD O of the master goes to SDI, the input to the device. And here's where things are a little interesting. Uh, to maximize the throughput, while you're sending data to the device and generating those clock signals, the device will take advantage of the fact that there's clock signal to send any data it needs to send back to the master. So the data out of the device will be connected to the data in of the master. So some interesting scenarios here. Uh, when the master wants to talk to the device, uh, while the master generates the clock and is sending bits over data out to the device, if the device needs to send anything, it will also output data to the, the exact same time uh, to the master. If it doesn't need to send anything, um, it will just either hold it high or low or even send gibberish. Uh, the master has to know that while it's writing something to the device, should it keep the things that it's reading or should it throw it away? Same thing for the device. Um, if the device is uh, reading something, um, it has to know what it should be sending. So if you're programming a microcontroller, you might be the master or you might be the device. This would be master mode, this would be slave mode, and you have to know what to do in both of those scenarios. Now, how does the device know that when the master is talking, it should listen? It has a chip select pin. And so the master will uh, bring the chip select pin from high to low to select that particular device. We may have another device and it will share the clock and the data out and the data in in parallel, but the master will have another chip select pin that is unique to this device. So when uh, this chip select is high and this chip select is low, this device is listening, will never have both chip select pins low at the same time. Now, uh, how fast can we go? Fast communication in this uh, case means that we can go as high as 20 megahertz. So that's the bits per second. And the fact that we're writing and reading at the same time uh, is kind of like a double bandwidth. So compared to something like UART, this is a very, very fast protocol. And you usually see it for uh, high intensity bandwidth devices like an LCD or memory. Those are really great places where you might want to use SPI, where you're sending just lots and lots of data all the time. So you really want to maximize that bandwidth. The downside, of course, is that every additional chip you add to the bus is another independent I.O. pin that you need to use. Uh, and we have very limited numbers of pins on some of our microcontrollers. So maybe you want another kind of bus where you don't have to use another pin uh, for every device that you add. That would be I2C. We'll cover that later. So now that we know we can send data uh, to the device and read back from it and generate a clock, um, how do we know what data to send? Well, you'd have to look very carefully at the data sheet for the device that you're using. We'll use that uh, in the next um, video. So for now, let's just pretend we just need to send one byte from the master to the device and let's write some code for the PIC32 uh, master. So I'm looking at my uh, uh, pinout 
and pin function sheet for the PIC32. And the first thing we have to do is we have to find where are the clock pins and the data pins for, say, SPI1. So I'm looking around, and here is SCK1 on pin 25, that's B14. So the uh, clock pin for SPI1, that's fixed. We can't move that around. But when we're looking for SDI and SDO1, the other two uh, data pins, they are not listed here because they are remappable. So we can uh, move them around uh, to different pins so that we don't have over overlapping functions for different pins. So here's the uh, output pin table, and I'm looking for SD01. So here's SD01, and it could be on any of these pins. So if I wanted SD01 to be on A1, I would say RP A1R bits dot RP1 A1R equals 0B0011, and that would assign SD01 to uh, A1. And for an input, I'm looking for uh, SDI1. Here's SDI1. It can be on a1 or B5 or B1 or any of those pins, and I would say SDI1R bits dot SDI1R is equal to say 0001 to be assigned to pin B5. Then I need a chip select pin, and there actually are specific, uh, they call them slave select pins. So there's a slave select 2, here's a slave, uh, slave select 1, jeez, uh, can be assigned to any of those pins. And the SPI module can be put in a mode that automatically controls the slave select pin. Uh, but in this case, we might want to talk to many devices, and that mode doesn't let us do that. So we're not going to use the official slave select pin for this case. We're just going to choose any pin we want uh, and turn it into a digital output pin and uh, toggle it high and low uh, in the code so that we can have multiple chip select pins if we need to. So let's look at a project that does this. I've written functions uh, init SPI uh, to initialize the pins, and then uh, I've got a function SPIIO that takes an unsigned char and returns an unsigned char. So remember that every time we write something, we're going to write this letter uh, out. We're also going to be reading something and returning it. Maybe we don't need that, so we'll just throw it away. And maybe we're just trying to read, so we'd write anything to get that thing back. But SPI is a little weird in that reading and writing happen simultaneously. So in my code, after initializing some pins like normal, I would call my initialize SPI function. And we have to do a few things. Um, uh, we need to set uh, SDO1 to A1, so that's done here. And we need to set uh, B5 to SDI1, that's done here. And if we look carefully at some of those pins, for instance, uh, A1 is also AN1, so that's an analog input pin. Uh, as is A0. So anything that's an analog input pin by default is going to be analog, and that's going to take precedence over our reprogrammable pins. So I need to make sure to turn off the analog capability of those pins. So we're going to do that here with ANCEL. So I could specifically say ANCEL A bits dot and then select the pin, or just turn off all of the analog pins on uh, the A port uh, so that they're digital. So we make the pins digital, and now we have them available to SPI. Now I'm also going to set uh, A0 as an output pin and initialize it high. That will be my chip select pin. Here's my uh, initialization for SPI1. So I'm going to just clear all the bits. Uh, the data sheet says you should read the buffer before you change anything. So that's the data that might be in there for some reason. So I'm going to read that. We calculate a uh, baud rate. And here I'm going extra slow. I'm going at 12 kilohertz um, so that I'll be able to see the data on my end scope. Um, if we uh, minimize this number to the number 1, the smallest it's allowed to be, that would be as fast as this particular pick could run, 12 megahertz. Now there's a couple uh, styles of SPI, whether you read in the middle of the clock or at the beginning of the clock, that kind of stuff. So uh, these set those parameters. And then I am making the pick the master in this case, so the master is the one that controls the clock. And then I turn on SPI. So this initialization does all the basic stuff you need to get ready to uh, use SPI. And here in my infinite while loop, I'm going to do, here's the very simple write. So I'm going to bring my chip select pin low. I'm going to call the SPIIO function to send, in this case, an unsigned char i that's just incrementing by one, uh, and I have a one hertz delay. 
and that's all this code does. So on the end scope, what I'll be able to do is I'll be able to trigger on the chip select pin when it's going from high to low. I'll see the number that's being printed as well as the clock, and then every second I should see a new number be printed. And then here's the SPIO function, very simple. Uh, uh, what's kind of weird is that SPI1 buff, this is where we put the data that we want to send. That's also where the data that gets read gets returned to. So the data I want to send gets put in SPI1 buff. I wait for it to be sent. And then while I was sending something, I was also reading something. Um, so the, whatever I read gets put back into that same buffer and I return it. And in this particular instance, I'm not actually talking to anything. So I'm not reading anything. But if I wanted to, I could have said uh, some variable is equal to this function uh, so that I could have read whatever the chip I was talking to you sent back. So let me turn on nscope. And in this case, uh, it's nice to have a four channel oscilloscope um, because I could see the uh, chip select, the uh, clock, the data, both in and out. In this case, I don't have uh, data coming back into the pixel, I'll, I'll leave that off. So the blue channel and the green channel are going to be my clock and data, and the red channel um, is the chip select. And right now I can't see anything, but maybe I get a blip every once in a while on red, and that shows that chip select went low, and that's how fast that data communication is. So we really have to zoom in to see the data. And then uh, it's going to scroll by too fast, so I'll turn on triggering on channel 1. And I know that um, the uh, nothing happens when the chip select is high, so I want to look for a falling edge. So here's my uh, chip select going low. Here's the clock being generated, 8 clock bits. And here's the data that's being sent at that particular uh, clock speed. And right now I'm incrementing by one every second. So we can see that whatever this number is is going up by one. And this is the opposite of a UART. On the left here, instead of the least significant bit, we have the most significant bit. And on the right is the least significant bit. So this is the same order as if you were going to write a binary number on a piece of paper or a board. So SPI can go incredibly fast. Uh, we can get lots of data in and out. The downside of being we need a unique chip select pin for every chip that we're talking to.